live from SABC Studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Welcome to this week's last episode of The Watchdog. My name is William Vogel and on the show tonight... Getting to our open 100 branches, we've, we've been going around, Post Bank has been going around to do an assessment of that. They'll do then the modeling of saying which branches are profitable when they will bring them on board. Is the Post Bank as ready to take on the role of a state bank as the Communication and Digital Technologies Minister says it is? That's the question we are asking this evening. My guest is, is former Post Office CEO Mark Barnes. He is here in studio with me. Tributes continue to pour in for former National Assembly Speaker Frini Genuala, former Presidential Advisor and University of Venda Chancellor Advocate Mujangu Gumbi. He will be my guest. The Watchdog starts now. The Post Bank is now ready to take on the role of a state bank. Well, that's according to Communications and Digital Technologies Minister Kumbuzo Njabin. We are 90% almost there to getting the Post Bank to become a state bank. And that resolution comes from the 52nd conference of the ANC. And now we are at the cusp of delivering the state bank. As a, and why is it important in terms of the state bank and economic transformation? It's important for a few things. One, the majority of South Africans are excluded financially. So they are, the participation of the post bank as a state bank will, exp will extend inclu financial inclusion to our people, not only banking them or banking the unbanked, but also giving <coughs> financial support to small businesses, to uh, 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 black owned businesses, to businesses in general as part of the, those interventions that the financial sector must make. In fact, I want to remind you. Okay, go ahead. In fact, I mean, you, 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 you've just uh, taken us straight to, uh, I mean, some of uh, those issues I actually wanted to explore with you. Because the reason uh, many people don't believe that these conversations do actually take place at, uh, uh, at these conferences or they do so meaningfully, it's precisely because of um, your inability as the governing party to make some serious inroads in the areas uh, of... Uh, you know, economic transformation, uh, dealing with poverty, dealing with unemployment in the country. I mean, in the, over the past uh, about three or so weeks, every day, as you count down to our conference, you've been highlighting issues every day. And this is one of the key issues that you've highlighted um, over the past uh, couple of weeks. And the reason people are skeptical about both your weather, you do actually have this meaningful conversation or you are making inroads in both uh, the way you think about them and in your ability to implement your own resolutions is because of the lack of progress. I think we need to acknowledge that we have been slow on the delivery part, but, we, but there should be an acknowledgement that there has been during the, 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 the current the 55th, uh, the 54th uh, ANC leadership, there has been an acceleration in terms of delivering on those uh, long outstanding resolutions, and I'll give the sector that we are in, in terms of communications, the spectrum that was due to be avail uh, released or auctioned by, for, uh, to be ready for 2010 has now been done. The digital migration that it was also supposed to have been ready by 2010, we are at the cusp of, of delivering it. The State Bank that I said, it comes from the 52nd resolution, is the, it's also almost there. You, you know the bill was debated in the uh, portfolio committee recommended for parliament and it's only for parliament to process it and our applications is ready to submit to the uh, to the prudential authority or the reserve bank for that to be considered well earlier this week the minister repeated um, uh, the commitment that, uh, uh, her comments rather um, saying that they are indeed committed uh, they are 90, the post bank is now 90% ready as you heard uh, there, but is it indeed ready? Well, someone who knows a lot more than most of us about the post, post bank is the post office's former CEO, and that's Mr. Mark Barnes, who joins me in the studio. Good evening, sir. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening. Nice to be here. 
from what you know, is it as ready as the minister says it is? I think we need to define some things first. Uh, let's, let me say this, that there is no debate but that we have to solve the lack of funding to the informal sector, if I want to call it that. And there is no doubt that that gap is sometimes filled by unscrupulous lenders who are lending people money at rates which they could never afford to repay. So the state has an ex a significant and extraordinary, but it's extraordinary, role to play. In February 2020, I wrote an article about the state bank, uh, which was published, and it was in support of a state bank. But we have to go back to the principles of banking. You cannot. Banking relies on the structure of its balance sheet. You, you lend out money according to a very known risk profile and the behavior of bad debts and all of these good things, which allows you to price the risk of failure into that lending equation and your aggregate book of assets. And if the general community at large behaves in line with the experience that you have, then the bank functions perfectly. They make a reasonably small return on the assets and a big return on the capital because they're using depositors' money, which is a very low cost of capital. That's how a bank works, essentially. At your peril, do you override the credit process? You, you, you cannot tell people to lend money. You cannot force people to lend money. What you can do with the appropriate mix of funding capital is you can structure a developmental fund funding product which is appropriate for the new forming businesses and associations which are, despite the very high cost of loans at the moment, still making money. Mm -hmm. So we should, we have to find a, a better solution, a more formal solution. And the post office and its extraordinary commercially in, irreplaceable infrastructure and the post bank within it because it has access to the national payment system, is an ideal distribution network access point between the formal uh, and informal, uh, informal markets. Now, that's just a general description of what we, what we need to do. But, but what we don't need to do is dictate how people should lend money. Okay? Because if you take away the analysis, then I wouldn't lend them the money, I'd give them the money. Okay? Because... Why would you burden them with the interest cost? You know, why don't we? So there's a mix of capital that's required. Okay? There's a, I mean, if you ask me, the reason why we can have a state bank is because the state has another basis of collection, which is tax. So if the state funds an entity which grows and becomes profitable, they get tax, which banks don't get. So they've got a double bite of the cherry and... The more employment that they create, the more sustainable growing businesses that they create, uh, the less they're going to have an obligation for social grants. So they've got a very special place in, in this discussion. But when the argument is made that we should lend money to places where commercial banks aren't lending money, we are entering into a fool's paradise. It won't last. So what you have to do instead of that is you have to design an appropriate loan package which has got certain conditions and behavioral expectations and costs and economic participation like tax and so on, uh, which thinks differently about a development, a development <coughs> economy. So, is, it, is any old bank okay for this? It isn't. Are development banks okay for it? Yes, they are. The Development Bank of South Africa, the IDC, DBSA, Land Bank, all of these had specific tailored products to focus. Now, they've all got histories, none of, none of which are particularly illuminating, <laughs> okay, because they potentially were misused. But if it is that you walk into a bank, and I'm not going to use names, and they say no, and you can walk across the, the road to, stand, uh, to Post Bank, and they say yes, something's wrong, okay, and... It's not sustainable. So what will happen is the, 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 the subsidy for, these, for this mistake is no different than just paying for the social grant for those that don't have the capacity to, to grow businesses. If you were to approach in partnership with the private sector, in partnership with the people who have a vested interest in 
business thriving, business in the informal, and there are lots of them. When I was in the post office, I used to go to all of these places. You go sit in the middle of Alexander, it's a thriving economy. People are transacting at fair market value at the right price and the right equations, and, and they're getting capital. Here's the truth. The truth is that businesses that are valid get capital. They're just getting it at the wrong price. So, uh, you know, it, it, you can't vote someone alone. Okay. You can't. It's not a popularity contest. It's a systemic uh, uh, evaluation of risk and return. Okay. Now, Postbank is a unique bank for a number of reasons. The only reason you need a banking license, the primary reason you need a banking license, is so that you can take money from the public. So that you can take public's money. That's what you need a license for. And the, and the reason that you get a license is because the Reserve Bank and the banking systems and all of those things oversee the behavior of the banks require them to operate within certain covenants and capital asset ratios and all of those things, adequacy ratios. And so the depositor's money is safe within limits. And there are ratios of equity capital to debt capital. All of these things are designed. And when the Reserve Bank sees a functional bank with functional systems, with functional expertise, with the appropriate branch networks and securities and all of those kinds of things, it says, yeah, we'll license you. And we, you and I, walk into a bank happily and put our money in that bank because we know that the Reserve Bank is overseeing it and we know that they're not being told what to do. Okay. If you tell a bank what to do, you might as well just push it out of the way. Now, there's a difference, and I'll stop now, there's a big difference with Postbank. Postbank operates under an exception of license because its depositors are guaranteed by National Treasury. It's a highly efficient bank. I'm talking three years back, okay? Mm -hmm. A highly efficient bank. And because the depositors are guaranteed by National Treasury, your money's safe. Mm -hmm. As safe as it ever will be. Mm -hmm. The safest. It's the safest bank. But there's a condition that National Treasury imposed on us and said, what you do with that depositor's money is very well defined. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, you couldn't invest in anything less secure than a money market deposit. I don't want to get technical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you take, you take the public's money and you put it in a safe place. Now, if you take that same public's money and some politician tells you what to do with it, you break the code. You mess with the system. But if you want to do that, you have to have very specific definitions of what constitutes a valid financial package. Otherwise, you can't be a bank. But is it your understanding that the way it's going to work is the politicians are going to tell the post bank what to do and how to do it? Is that what's going to happen? Well, if I were to, I'm only responding to what I hear. The, the, the ANC conference passed a resolution that they will dispense money where the banks aren't. I don't know if you regard that as an instruction, but that's pretty damn close to an instruction. Well, my understanding was that, like, in very broad and general terms, yeah. uh, which is where you started, yeah. Yeah, the point is, there's a need. There's a need. And so we don't fill that need at our peril, at yeah. all of our peril. So that Done. is not in doubt, Done. right? Now, um, so you've got to then come up with something that's going to speak to address that need, which is why, in other words, my understanding is that what how the ANC's conference resolution says, or affirms that position, the ANC and says, says, now move. Yeah, the ANC says, quite rightly, in my view, that the banks aren't doing it. The, uh, I don't want to label them, mm. those banks, mm. the big banks, they aren't doing it. Okay. So, well, we're going to make it happen. Mm. I agree with that yeah. point of departure. Yeah. The risk profile, if it's not acceptable as a loan, so if you, you know if you want to go and buy a house, they do an evaluation, they look what the house is worth, whatever. if you went in willy-nilly and you wanted to borrow a million rand for a house that they only thought was worth 200,000, they wouldn't give you the money, nor should anyone else give you the money, because it's not a fair deal and it will collapse. Okay? What happens when debt is no longer 
on its own applicable, then you start adding equity capital or state subsidy capital to make the equation work. Okay, so you go, okay, this business is earning 100 a month. I can't lend it money that it costs it 200 a month. Okay, mm. and no one wants to lend in that money and they can't get the money anywhere else. Okay, so I'm going to lend you money that costs you 50 a month because that's what you can afford. Mm. Then as the state, because I have a vested interest in creating employment and I have a vested interest in reducing my social uh, development bill and all of these kinds of good things and invested interest in creating employment, I'm going to augment the loan package with another form of capital mm -hmm. that allows this business to exist. And how am I going to get paid back? You're going to get, make profits and, and I'm going to get tax. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm going to reduce my, my burden. But the loan piece, the piece that comes from the bank, you can't change the rules that apply to that piece without upsetting the system. So. Uh, well, okay. When you wanted to buy the post office, the post office, yeah. how did you think um, you, were, you were going to do this? Well, first of all, I never thought of Postbank as a place that lent money. Postbank, for me, gave, gave us access to the national payment system, which meant that we could process transactions, that we could clear, uh, that we could do all sorts of things. We could, we could pay for your e-commerce parcel. You could pay your customs duty. authority. It was a transaction-based. It wasn't a loan-based company. And we weren't allowed to give loans because we didn't have the systems and the expertise. Okay, so, so, so uh, how, what was I going to do? There, is, there are ample examples around the world of successful post offices. All of them have financial services embedded in their system. And that marries, that financial technology marries with their physical distribution to create uh, this network that, that succeeds. So, uh, so I didn't want, want to, we couldn't pay social grants if we didn't have a, a bank transacting capability. And so why did we want to pay social grants? Because I didn't see it as a business, I saw it as a service. Mm. Why should the private sector profit from our gogos? Mm. No, man, it's a government function to look after them. Mm. So bring that money into the state. Mm. Why should unscrupulous lenders using Section 26A deductions be able to entice our old people into making loans that they cannot afford? No, stop it. We'll look after that. We, the post office, as an organ of state, mm. will design you a funeral policy mm. so you can get rid of the six that someone sold you. We'll design you an appropriate medical aid. All of those things which will, would, which will have protection mechanisms designed specifically. So what did I want to do and why did I want to? I, there are examples. Um, uh, the UP, the, you know, Amazon in the, in the US bought a stake in the United Parcel Service. Why? You can order anything you like we are on the internet, but unless they can deliver that watch to your house, you don't own it. So they saw the marriage between technology of goods flow and, and physical delivery. Now, that's what, that's what I saw as well. And so in my discussions, when I left, when I left the, the post office, I started having discussions with international players in the e-commerce space. And there were at least two of them who said we'd love that distribution network. Okay, so I said, well, let's see if we can cut a deal with the state. And my proposal was to leave the state in with certain very entrenched rights to give the, the, the employees of the, you know, one of the faults we have in our country is that public servants aren't incentivized on outcomes. They're punished for failure and they have to argue for increases. You should say to them, if this, then that. Mm. So I wanted them to have shares. I wanted to say to them, don't worry about your salary. If we make money, you'll make money. Mm. It'll change the way you feel about life. Okay. And said, outcome basis. So I put this to them. And uh, that very same minister made the comment that I'd walked into the post office to ruin it so that I could buy it on the cheap. Ah, oh, that's just yeah, was quite scathing about yeah, you. I can't even bother to respond yeah. to such nonsense. Okay. So now. I think that's coming. I think all of us in South Africa are so close to a potential collapse that at some point we better start liking each other.
and holding hands and forgetting about where we came from or what happened and all of those things. I don't mean forgetting. Start thinking about where we're going to. Now, I'm getting all of these master classes in banking. Yesterday, I spoke to the CEO of Standard Bank. I don't know mm. if we have uh, a soundbite from, from that interview, but Sim Chabalala um, had something to say about this, this initiative, and I want to check if uh, you actually um, agree with him um, on this one. Take a listen. The Minister of Communication was here and was again talking about something she said on Monday about um, us being a step closer to a state bank, which, of course, as you know, is a demand of the of the of the of the governing party and what they are they are working towards. And the reason um, they feel we need to. Uh, go in that direction is because they feel that the banks don't do what they ought to be doing over and above everything uh, that you've just spoken about. That you do all that, all those things you mentioned for as long as you know that um, you know um, they are making money for you. But where you feel that you're not going to make money, you you don't even venture like into that. Hence the demand by the ANC of uh, for a state bank. We take 10 cents of capital from shareholders. We take 90 cents of deposits and we lend one rand. Um, if we don't get the deposits back, the shareholders take the, the, uh, the, the, the knock in that, uh, in that instance. Mm fundamentally for the safety and soundness of the system when we take your deposit using the capital that we've got to protect ourselves against the risk that we're taking on we have to be absolutely certain i use those words advisedly absolutely certain that we will be able to get the money back so that we can pay your deposit on demand the consequence of that the consequence of that is that when we lend we have to lend with a high degree of certainty and therefore, the people who are able to take risks in the nature of venture capital are a one type of, a, of, a, of, a, of an entity. It's not a commercial bank. A state bank may well be able to do that. But the important point to make there is that the policymakers make that decision conscious of what they're doing. In other words, they will be taking taxpayers' money and putting it at risk. Hmm. And that's a policy choice that leaders make. I mean, I, I'm not in a position to, I can speak with passion to you about the role of the bank and mm -hmm. disagree respectfully with you speaking on behalf of ministers and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I can understand why they would be making that case, but it, it's a contradiction. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's, it's not capable of re uh, reconciliation. So he's saying the shareholders take the risk. In this case, the state Excellent. is the shareholder, and the state should bear the risk. Okay. But the state shouldn't bear undue risk. The state shouldn't encourage a reckless disregard for credit principles. What the state should do in its own interest and in the interest of the country at large is say, we identify this portion of bankable risk, and above that, there's another risk. There's a developmental risk, there's an encouragement risk, there's a startup risk. We will fund that piece of risk. Why? Because we get paid tax when you make a profit. So we've got another channel of economics, mm -hmm. which the Standard Bank hasn't got. The Standard Bank doesn't get paid tax. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know what the thing about banking is? Banking, you either get all your money or you lose money. There's no upside. You don't lend money and make more than the face value of the loan mm -hmm. plus interest. So the state can do that. So he has the total economics of the firm. It's got to pay this much interest, which is properly thought through to the bank. Then, then it makes a profit. It's got to pay that mm. to the state. The state takes that profit and reinvests it. Mm. So there is, it's a partnership, but not a dictatorship. Okay. You cannot overrule the wisdom of credit. Credit is, by the way, not an exciting place. Mm. It's a boring place. The people who sit in credit <laughs> are steeped in systemic understanding and, 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 and things of that nature. So if you start telling credit people to do that, they don't, they don't, it's not what they do. But you can see a bigger picture. So for example, 
Forget about the state as shareholder. Take a private equity company, putting capital into a, a young, growing business. It gets a return out of the profits. Mm. So it can do that. Mm. But, the, but the business can only tolerate so much interest cost. If your interest cost exceeds your, uh, your, your, your net income before interest, you go broke. Mm. And then the equity starts getting eaten up. I don't want to get into a technical, yeah. but I'm sure it's clear. Yeah. Well, what is not clear yeah. um, to many people is how um, the post bank um, can be seen to be what everyone agrees is what South Africa needs, right? Yeah. When it is finding it difficult to manage the grant, the grants. Oh, I, I would be surprised if right. the post bank is ready to fill yeah. this role. Okay. There are people who are saying if it is as easy for people to hack, you know, the post bank, you know, um, which they don't see often when it comes to your commercial banks. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying it's not happening. <laughs> they may well be good at hiding it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I don't know because th those are some of the theories out there. But these two main things are the things that worry people, hence they find it incredibly difficult to believe that indeed the post bank is almost ready to, to, yeah. to, to fulfill the role. I think uh, banking has become, even our big banks, I would argue, are behind the curve on technology. Where money is being lent by micro lenders and at the coalface lenders to businesses which are, uh, you know, lending money against purchase orders and doing things at extraordinary cost. Those systems are governed by what I might call live credit technology. They know exactly what's happening in your business this morning, this afternoon and tonight. They're not quarterly reviews of how you're going. There's an, an intense technological involvement, oversight and power within those banks. I would argue the post bank hasn't begun that journey necessarily. Now, I was there three years ago. They might have done all these things, and I wish them well. We need them. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you're going to have to hire for the higher risk the best credit analysis in the country, not the easiest, the best. It's harder to lend to higher risk. It requires smarter people. Do you think you're going to persuade those smart people to go and work for the post bank when there isn't even a share option scheme for them to, you know, I mean, we, we have to marry these different forces that create common cause and vested interest. Now, the state has a role to play in our economy. There's not even, you'd have to be stupid not to understand that. Okay. What is its role? Where, are, where does it cross? Where do the lines get blurred? The lines gets blurred. If you happen to have a name, call it Post Bank, and you say, that is a state bank, uh -uh, but you've got to say, what is a state bank? What are its characteristics? What does its balance sheet look like? Why is it different from commercial banks? To enable it to do something different to commercial banks sustainably. I can give people money all day. We, you know, our government talks proudly about the extent of social uh, uh, development. We don't do social development in this country. We do social rescue. Okay. So it's, it's not a proud achievement that 29 people are, on so, are social dependent. It's not. What we need to do is create independent people. Okay. So know your place. Stay in your lane. And if we do that, somewhere in a mix between the state understanding its capital role, which it gets rewarded through from tax, and marrying that with valid credit expertise and starting to lend money to young growing businesses in our South Africa, then that's what we all want to do. And that has to, and no one else except the state can do it. Yeah, yeah but, but, but what I'm specifically asking now is it's knowing media, what you know. know, knowing what you know about the post bank. It's three years old when I know. Uh, yes. Plus, or adding to that, the fears that people have actually expressed that uh, if it's easy, you know, to crack the code um, and, and, and steal money, or as easy as, uh, you know, the last case where a service provider was suspected mm -hmm. of having uh, been the one who, who did this. If it's that easy and if it's uh, so difficult, uh, often, 
um, for the post uh, office to pay social grants. Are they really ready? No, they're not ready now. There can be no discussion about that. And I know that's the only soundbite that's going to come. So, 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 says they're not ready. They're not ready. I'd, I'd be very surprised if they're ready. Okay. So you, you, do you think the minister is being way too optimistic? No, I'm not going to comment on the minister. What, what, what I can say is this. They could be a vehicle which could be made ready because of their relationship with the post office, because they already have the footprint, because they, post offices must be a place where you go because you trust it, because it's your government looking after you. You know you're not going to get ripped off there, you know you're not going to get all, all those kinds yeah. of so things. And so it's exactly the right place to go and to have this happen. Now, are, are, are they ready? By the way, Postbank's tiny. When I left there, that four billion of assets. I mean, that's not even a starter. That's not a starter pack for what we're talking about. We're talking about having to fund the informal economy of South Africa that runs into hundreds of billions. So where is the capital going to come to lend out? You can't swim a lend capital out. You've got to first get depositors, as some said to you, and you take that depositors money and you make sure it's safe and then you lend it out. First banks a spec in this debate now. Could they use their unique relationship with the physical footprint? Absolutely. Could they infuse into the systems of post-bank the mindsets of development bank, of IDC, of whatever? Could they utilize the economic model of putting capital into the economy and getting paid tax back? All of that could happen through the post-bank. But you can't even wake up one morning and go, oh, we've got the post-bank, let's call that a state bank. That's a label, not an understanding. That's, That's satisfying good. voters. You can't become a dentist by a popular vote. Okay? If, you know, you've got to become a dentist by knowing what to do. You can't become a state bank because someone changes your name to a state bank. Well, you see, I mean, remember what gave rise to this, to this discussion is, I mean, when I heard the minister saying this twice this week, that we, we're almost there, 90% there. That's like ripe for the peaking. You know? Well, it now, might be exactly uh, that. It, I think you've got it. This consists right about trying to picking. understand, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, whether I, 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 you know, no. My answer is no, and and I haven't even looked at the balance sheet of the post bank today. I don't know what it's doing with its money. Is it still adhering to the money market deposit? You know, all of those kinds of things. But I don't know what, I mean, I don't know, what the, I forget what the GDP is, I forget what the size of the problem is. I don't know what Standard Bank's balance sheet footings are and all those kind of things. But four billion. If the state wants to create state bank out of post bank, they better have a hell of a lot of capital lined up. Because what they're going to have to do to become Standard Bank is convince you and I to take our money out of Standard Bank and put it into post bank. That's the question you have to ask. That's the question the Reserve Bank has to answer. Well, in fact, the Reserve Bank hasn't gotten answers to quite a number of questions that um, it is asked. Well, we've now got, we've now got a, a notion that the Reserve Bank must change their mandate to specifically include developmental, a developmental mandate mm -hmm. in, in relation to employment. Mm -hmm. Those are nice words. The, the, the difference between that desire and that description and the manifestation of a sustainable product of that good thinking is a big, long distance, which requires extraordinary maturity, yeah. highly sophisticated systems. And, I mean, it's easy to give away money. It's not so easy to get it back. Get it back. <laughs> okay. And we would, we would create more flaws than virtues by passing money into the economy which cannot be paid back. We would create more trouble than good. You can't lend someone money at 40%, okay? Because there isn't an asset in the country that pays 40%, man. Mm. So you, you are lending them, you, uh, credit becomes an enemy, not an enabler. If you willy-nilly start lending money to your friends, that's another discussion, mm. but if you start lending money which people can't afford to pay you back, you're killing them, not enabling them. Mm. Eventually, the chickens will come home to roost. So, 
Do I think it's necessary? Absolutely. Do I think we have to have a state bank properly thought through? Absolutely. Do I think it's necessarily just an enlarged version of post bank, which is taking depositors from... I mean, when I was a kid, I had a little post bank book. Do you know why those post bank books work? Because uh, the, uh, mom could check whether you draw money out. It was written there. That you didn't have a credit card. You could somewhere go and spend money. Okay. Now, that... The idea is great. The notion that post bank should be the sacrificial, the, 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 the poster child for a state bank, I think is so far off the mark. I would construct a post bank, I mean a state bank, out of a merger of all of our other major developmental organizations. And I'd go, this part of your business is now defined as investment, not lending, mm -hmm. investment in a new developmental mandate economy. Don't ask the banks to do it and don't begrudge them that they aren't. Because if you force the banks to do it, say, we'll have no banks left. Okay. What you've got to do is, you might, what you might be able to say to the banks is, and I'll get into all sorts of trouble for saying, you might say, of your loans, we'd like you to have a certain amount which you recognize is not a bankable loan, but is your prescribed asset contribution to the capital base of the state bank, because what's going to happen is those clients are going to grow out of that formative years and become proper clients of you, Standard Bank, in the future. We can do this thing. We, no, can. we have to do this thing. Okay. Is, is there no case to be made for uh, maybe compelling or... Uh, is too strong a word, getting the commercial banks to plug some, some of the holes somewhat. Sure. And I'm asking this, let me make, no, very, no, no. Let me make very random examples, right? Remember when... Uh, 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 sorry, before I forget the point, sorry. Mm -hmm. You can't force them to make loans. You can tax them mm -hmm. more. Hence I'm saying, is there a case to be made? Is there a way... Yeah, to, to, to do it. Let, let me put it if, that way. If, is there a way to do it? Because, I mean, remember back in the day, I mean, our radio stations, including your public uh, broadcasters. service broadcasters, right, yeah. were playing 90% uh, overseas music. Yeah. Right? They were then compelled. You know, they were given, you know, qu uh, like quotas that you must play X amount of local music. What happened? Things went the other way around. You actually had the, 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 the local music industry grew and grew. Right? In the uh, state radio yeah. stations or in all radio stations. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's now the other way around. You know, there's a lot of local content on our radio and, 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 and television you know, stations. It makes sense. They're, everyone is making money, you know, uh, um, and so on. Hence, I'm asking, is there no case to be made? There is a case to be made for the financial system. I'm not saying banks. For the financial system to be, to be required to participate in a dual commercial and developmental mandate. Okay? But there is no justification or sensible, sustainable outcome in forcing banks to lend money, which they otherwise wouldn't Let's lend. not say force. Let's, let's, let's stay away from the word force. Well, it didn't just, nice let's just say, yeah, let's, use a, let's use a nice word. Let's say, okay, let's put it differently. Them. Can we incentivize yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the banks to yeah. uh, start? Well, I think it should be removed from their mandate. Okay, I think we should say, listen, uh, you know, we want to gather more money at the center. Listen, you and I pay tax. Okay, well, I pay a lot of tax. Okay, so, so if we knew that that tax was going to be properly invested in young, growing businesses and young, growing people, by the way. That's half our problem. We've got all these old people at the top. Okay. If we were starting, we'd pay more tax, willingly. Okay. But you can't force me to pay tax into something which is self-evidently not going to succeed or be sustainable because you'll need more tax when it fails. Mm. So it's a complex debate. And it's, it's, it's also, you know, mixed in with political and other innuendos and issues and feelings and all of those kinds of things. But if you were to sit in a corner and design the optimal financial package for the informal economy, lots of people could design that. Lots of people I know could go, this is what you need as a financial capital base for a young growing business that's 
you know, that, that, that is not looking only to the formal banking system. And, and then you could go to the people who understand equity, to the people who understand mezzanine debt, to the people like the government who have got a vested interest in the profitability in tax, and you could create, you could mix a cake that will taste very nice in Alexander. And we better do it. If you were to give anyone one, cast to listen, but two, um, on whom moving from this point to achieving what you also agree is what needs to be done, what would you say to them today? I would say to them, I'd start off by saying make it simple. I had this discussion with another minister once, okay, just to give you my attitude on this. We were talking about increasing social grants by 4%, which would have been 8 billion rand at the time, more um, rough figures. I said to you, Minister, instead of increasing social grants, give me the money. He said, what will you do with it? I said, I'll go around looking at operating businesses in informal settlements and I'll borderline recklessly give them the money. Okay. If they registered as taxpayers, if they, if, you know, two or three very basic 48-hour turnaround. What do you think will happen, Minister? He said, well, some of, them will, some of them will throw it away, some of them will drink it, some of them will steal it. Some of them. But the overwhelming majority, and this is the core issue here, the overwhelming majority for the first time in their life would have been shown trust and faith. And when you show someone trust and faith, they generally don't abuse it. And that 8 billion would become 80 billion. Instead of wasting away in social rescue. So I'm saying absolutely the government's got a role to play. It cannot impose that role on an institution which has a very different mandate on how it transacts business. You know, you can't, you, what it can do is it can partner that and reduce the cost of capital because it has another income stream that it looks after. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm sort of making these points clearly. Maybe there isn't enough time. Maybe I need a blackboard. I usually <laughs> draw things, you know. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, I, 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 it, it, it is possible. You can't put it in a box. It is a team sport, this funding of the informal economy. It's an imperative sport. And I'll tell you the best part is it will be fabulous in its outcome. If we, there are businesses that are making money in the informal market, borrowing money at 30, 40% per annum when you do the sums. You know, they say you can't, you know, well, once you paid the fees and you've done this and you've done that and you've done that. And never mind the criminality which starts creeping into the repayment of loans and the, and the force and all of those kinds of things which start manifesting. There. If you could lend money to people at a, re if you could fund people at a reasonable rate, let me not say lend the money. If you could fund people at a reasonable rate, you would create growth in this economy which would way exceed the 5% that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I wrote about this. I called it local economic empowerment, L-E-E. -E. Go down into the villages. Go down. I've spent a month driving around small towns in this country looking. Go down to the people who have almost nothing except a smile and show some faith in them and provide funding to them at a reasonable cost and it'll all just get better. The level of the seabed will rise. But don't shirk your responsibility by telling someone who shouldn't do that to do it. Don't walk up to a bank and say, from now on, you're going to do this. They go, it's not in my DNA. Okay? Don't. Become their partner, not their boss. Find a solution. You know, I don't know if you watch rugby at all, but in rugby, there are big, strong guys in the middle of the scrum, and they're skinny little guys that can run like hell at the wing. Okay? They pass the ball to each other because the big, strong guy's got to go find the ball. But he can't run as fast as the skinny little guy. So he gives him the ball. Why? Because they've got a common purpose. It's simple. The end game for rugby is the guy with the highest score when the whistle blows wins. I don't care what it takes. I'll pass the ball to the right person. We should pass the ball around between these sources of capital, including international capital and grant capital and developmental capital from organizations like the World Bank and all of these kinds of things. They all need to be brought into the mix. But before we get that money, 
so that we can hand it with trust to our people. We need to demonstrate a responsibility and trust that we will look, take good care of that money ourselves. Okay? Some of that is at risk. We are. I couldn't, I, I'd love this to happen. I'd love to make, I'd love to have a role in making it happen. I, I sent that article to the then Deputy President. He was wildly enthusiastic about it, but that was three years ago before, you know, before the wind started blowing and the sea got rough. Do you still regret having resigned from the Yes, I do. I Why? should have... It was a matter of principle. I didn't agree that they should take the bank out of the post office because it would be the end of the... The post office today is bankrupt. It's best... From what I can read in the newspaper, I don't, you know, I've got nothing to do with it. Um, I shouldn't have left in anger. I should have stayed and fought. I should have stood up publicly and said, I will not let this happen. And I should have stayed there and fought and fought and fought until we prevailed. And I had the backing. Strangely enough, look at me, I don't look like I'd get the backing. I had the backing of the people in the post office, I've still got it today, of the unions. Why? We changed the cultural expectation of who we were. We thought, when I, when I arrived there, it was, failure was a refuge. It was a place you went to, to be amongst friends. Okay. And that changed. We changed that. We said it's okay to do your homework on time. Ladies started wearing their post office scarf in a taxi. That's when I, we, I loved it, by the way. Absolutely, I loved it. I, 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 I found things about myself which I never knew existed. Like empathy and encouragement. Thing. Anyway, that's just not about me. Um, yeah, I do regret it. And, and I do regret on a bigger basis that we don't have it within us as fellow South Africans to hug each other more often, that we don't listen to each other, that we don't see ourselves as a partnership, that we see ourselves as winners and losers. We can't do that much longer. Mark Barnes. Well. Thank you very much. Do you need a hug? I can give you one. Yes, I want to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well. After the break, former National Assembly Speaker Dr. Fini Jinwala has passed away. We pay tribute to her. Don't go away. Well, uh, former Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Dr. Fini Jinwala has passed away. She was the country's first National Assembly Speaker in the Democratic Party. Uh, parliament. She passed away last night, age 90, following a stroke two weeks ago. Now, joining me for more reflections is former presidential advisor and University of Venda Chancellor, advocate Mujangu Gumbi, as well as the executive secretary of the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution, and that's Lawson Knight. Good evening to both of you. Thanks very much uh, for your time. Um, advocate Gumbi, if I may start with you, your your thoughts after hearing um, of the passing of Dr. Jinwala? Thank you very much, Buyo. Uh, I, I think, first of all, really heartfelt condolences to the family, uh, including Lawson there, who's with us. Um, it, it came as a shock. I mean, we all know that she has not been well, but still it came as a shock to know that Freni has, has passed on. And uh, it's a great loss, a great loss of a wonderful South African and internationalist. What would you remember the most about her? I think just her, her strength her, of character, her, her commitment to the empowerment of women, um, her no-nonsense approach <laughs> to, to everything, um, her, her candor. And, and, and really just a braver, mm. just quite a very brave person. I remember a time, uh, Lawson, I was still a reporter, uh, reporting from Parliament, I mean, at the, at the time, um, when the 
when ministers started um, to use that uh, South African word, uh, delaying parliament, you know, um, uh, and they were on, they were not honoring um, their appointments uh, with committees of parliament. And she called this crisis committee. Uh, the late uh, Steve Tread at the time was the leader of uh, government business. Um, uh, and uh, they really made it clear to the executive, which was unheard of at the time, that they were not going to tolerate their their nonsense. Mm -hmm. No, indeed. Uh, she ran an incredibly tight ship at uh, the National Assembly and, uh, you know, realized uh, very early on that uh, this was a critical institution in our democracy and that it needed to be built in the right way so that it could uh, help us to grow and sustain our democracy. Uh, unfortunately, some of that good work from the early days has not been uh, carried through more recently. But I recall that uh, that example that you just used for you, uh, because she would at the time she would uh, have regular meetings with uh, President Mandela, and he would ask her what were the issues in Parliament, and she would read those with him, uh, with him. Uh, and he would uh, call ministers to order and say, why aren't you going to Parliament? And uh, you know uh, there was that kind of relationship that ensured that Parliament was the primary institution in, in our in our democracy, that it was very much a kind of people's parliament that uh, Freni wanted to portray as an open institution, an outreach, uh, an inst uh, institution that reached out to ordinary people. And uh, she realized that that was going to be critically important in order to, uh, to build our democracy and to get people to believe that this democracy that we had fought for so hard was, was, was actually delivering. And, uh, you know, she, she earned the respect of uh, members of political parties across the spectrum. Everyone in the House respected her. And, uh, you know, you certainly would not have seen in her day the kinds of disruptions that we see in Parliament today. In fact, uh, Advocate Gumbi, um, earlier on our sister show, uh, Full View, uh, former Cabinet Minister uh, uh, Fraser Mleket, he was talking about, was quoting her, in fact, uh, what she wanted to do or uh, right at the beginning, which was to embrace uh, opposition parties, make sure that they are heard and seen, uh, and, and she regarded that as a, as a, as a priority. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think she belonged to a generation that that showed us what is possible, what what this country can be, and and how we can work together to build the country. I mean, I started working with her before the elections, where I I, I saw her in the Women's National Coalition, which uh, and I represented the Black Consciousness Movement in it. But uh, she was a founder of the Women's National Coalition and she was able to work with us very closely. And, and beyond the elections, then there was a women's caucus in parliament, which was, which was across, I mean, with representation across all parties. And that women's caucus was able to really push the envelope in parliament. It really is a pity that that uh, structure uh, 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 was not sustained, but that's that's who Freddie was. You know, she 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 had absolute respect for all people, and she was able to bring them together around a common agenda, and uh, and and uh, and uh, and that's why she was able to work with opposition parties in parliament so well. Um. I, I don't know, Lawson, uh, perhaps it's an unfair uh, a question, but one wonders whether uh, during those uh, years that some have called the nine wasted years, if uh, Frini Junwala was still the Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, we would have seen some of what we saw. Yeah, no, thanks for you. Uh, just on the previous point, you know, one of the things that Freni did and made sure that happened in the first democratic parliament, yeah. where we, at the time we only had seven political parties in the yeah. National Assembly, but she ensured that every single party had a front bench, mm. so that when people watched on TV and saw parliament, they saw their representatives there sitting on a front bench, that everyone was treated with, uh, with dignity and, and with equal respect. Um, you know, on your point, you know, uh, Freni was, was tough, and it was her toughness, but also she was tough but fair, and that's why she earned the respect of all political parties. And I think uh, had she or someone like her 
been in control of the National Assembly in, the, in those times that you refer to, uh, that we would probably not have seen the kind of behavior that we saw. Uh, not to say that we didn't have skirmishes in Parliament in the 90s, we did, but she dealt with it very, very quickly and very, very firmly. Lawson Naidu, Advocate Gumbi, let me thank both of you for agreeing to come on the program and sincere apologies for starting a little late um, because of some technical glitches um, we had. But thank you so much for coming through. Freni Jinwala will be buried in a private funeral according to the wishes of her family. May her soul rest in peace. Till we meet again on Monday, have a great weekend.